Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you remember when it was? Can you recall when it happened and what it was? Can you remember when you saw, tasted, or felt something that was so great and awesome, you knew everything after that was just going to be a giant disappointment? For example, you'd have a tough time convincing me that mountains aren't the most beautiful thing God dropped on this planet for us to enjoy. I can still remember the first time I came to Juneau to start house hunting, just kind of like spinning in place, looking around at all the different things, all the, the mountains, the glacier, the water, everything. And I thought, that's it. I'm broken. <laughs> Nothing can compare to this. Or the very first time I smoked a brisket. It's a long process, at least 12 hours. I made a pot of coffee, poured it into my thermos, and spent the entire night making sure things were exactly right. Was I tired the next day? You bet. But when I took that first bite and it was all perfectly balanced, salty, smoky, tender, I knew there was no going back. Nothing would ever be able to hold a candle to this. What about one more? What about the first time you held your child in your arms? At least for me, there was this sweeping feeling of how much life was about to change. But change in a good way. I don't think you can quite understand how much uh, of a responsibility and blessing from God children are until you're holding them like that. There's just nothing like it. And you probably have your own list of life-changing events that make everything else pale in comparison. Something, someplace, or someone that you can't even imagine having an equal in your life. But here's another question I want you to think about. Does your Bible make the list? Is it included in your list of things that after you interact, you've interacted with it the first time, you knew nothing was ever going to compare? Access to a Bible might be one of the biggest things 21st century American Christians take for granted. The Guinness Book of World Records estimates that over 5 billion Bibles have been printed. So it's not exactly a hot commodity. You can access it on your phone or computer with just a few taps or clicks. I grew up in the church. I even went to private Christian elementary schools and a high school. You know how easy it is to take it for granted when your relationship with it is like that? You know how quickly you can forget that there's nothing out there quite like the words of your God when it feels like you can just get it anytime that you want? We need something to kick us into gear and remind us of what an awesome, unequaled treasure we have in our Bibles. And we're going to do that using Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We don't know who wrote this psalm, but I love the picture language he uses to illustrate his point. Just look at the blessings he talks about if you stick with God's word. He says you're going to stand out in a world stuck in sin. Right? The world doesn't find any joy in what God says. People stuck in sin don't see any point or purpose to it. So they're called the wicked, sinners, mockers. But that's not who you are. You stand out from the crowd in your joy and happiness because they're tied to what God has to say to you. And then take that one step further and look at how he talks about more blessings that you can enjoy. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now in a place like Juno where you, you can't throw a rock without hitting some standing water, the image of a tree planted by streams of water doesn't seem that special. But in a dry desert climate like Israel, they needed a water source if they had any hope of growing something. Good crops depended on good water. And God talks about people producing fruit too. 
In Galatians, he puts it this way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All great things. And if you want to produce those fruits, you have to be planted next to a great water source. And what is your water source? The law of the Lord on which you meditate day and night. We hear it right from the mouth of God himself. He promises spiritual prosperity to the one who plants himself in the Bible. The one who yearns for God's own word because his words have no equal. They will find prosperity. And finally, all of that prosperity is tied to the fact that in God's word, we get connected to Jesus, who lifts us out of the dry desert of sin and and plants us in faith in him. The Bible is the way that the Holy Spirit puts you in touch with your Savior, Jesus. The Word is the way the Spirit gives life to people dead in sin. And that's its unique claim to fame. The thing only it can do. And you see why the psalm talks about the awesome blessings and prosperity that belong to those who plant themselves in God's Word. And then there's the opposite. What happens to the ones who choose something else to be the thing that impresses them day after day? Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. My only experience with chaff is when I'm roasting coffee at home. And chaff is just the little like papery husk on the outside of the coffee bean. And when you roast them, the chaff just flies off. And I hate the chaff. It's so light. It flies absolutely everywhere. It gets blown around by the slightest breeze. It gets stuck in my hair. It's tough to sweep up because it's just so light and easily swayed. That's a good reality check for what it's like when you aren't rooted in God and in his word. And just like a tree that has no roots doesn't have a chance when the wind howls, they don't stand a chance when Jesus comes in all his glory with all his judgment. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The way of the wicked leads to destruction. Instead of putting roots down into the life-changing and life-saving word of God, they chose a path that leads to destruction. Instead of enjoying what God has to tell them and reading and learning it, they chose to be cut off from the blessings that God holds out in in the Bible. And we're talking about the blessings that come with God's word today because of how important those blessings are. The, The message of the Bible is one that everyone needs to hear. God tells us truths that you and I could never figure out on our own. He answers all of our big questions like, Where did we come from? What is the purpose of life? In the Bible, God makes himself known to us. And yeah, you can learn some things about God by looking at nature or or, or listening to that voice of your conscience speaking to you. But that's like looking at a Polaroid of the back of somebody's head and expecting that you can know everything about them. It's not the full picture. If you want to really know who God is and what he is like, you have to hear it straight from the source. And the Bible Let's us do that. The purpose of the Bible is to show us who Jesus is and what he did for this world. The Bible is the message that every last person on the planet is guilty of sin and deserves to die and be separated from a good God forever. And then comes Jesus. And the Bible tells us he became a man, lived perfectly in our place, and died a death we deserve so we could look forward to life instead of death. God's word tells us that Jesus came and said, Give me all of your baggage, your sin, guilt, lies, and sense of shame, and I'll put them to death with me on the cross. I'll take what you have, sin and death, and give you what I have, perfection and eternal life. But you can't know about that and believe it if you don't have access to God's word. And that's why the Reformation that got started 504 years ago in Germany was so momentous. It was all about making sure God's people had access to their Heavenly Father. Because he wants to be accessible. Children of God want nothing more than to sit at his feet, learn from his word, and bask in his grace. They love to hear and learn about who he is. But when Martin Luther was around, the church actually set itself up in between God and his people. Instead of helping people get into a relationship with Jesus through the word, They were actually stopping people from going to the Savior for forgiveness by adding extra steps and middlemen. They made the word of God, which has no comparison when it comes to knowing Jesus, 
inaccessible to the average Joe. So God used a man, a.k.a. Martin Luther, to point people back to what God's word actually says. Where people once saw an angry, distant God who, who couldn't wait to punish bad people for their sins, Luther rediscovered the reality of the Bible. When almost everyone in the world thought righteousness was something they had to earn, Luther reminded them of what God says in his word. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Martin Luther took a stand that nothing is worth comparing to the powerful grace God shows us in the Bible. Even when taking a stand meant that he was threatened, that he had to go into hiding and, and was forced from his church home, he took a stand on God's word and the facts it presents. That salvation in Jesus is not something you can earn. It is a gift freely given by your Father in heaven, moved by his grace alone. And the way you and I or anyone gets those blessings is through faith in Jesus. And how do you get faith? Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. See why the word is such an important treasure? God's word is where he invites sinners to find forgiveness, peace, comfort, and strength. The word is the tool God's Holy Spirit uses to get people connected to his grace in Jesus. The word is the stream of water where the Father plants everyone who puts their trust in him. And that word makes us produce fruit. All of those fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then some. In the Word, we find all that we need to prosper, maybe not always financially or health-wise, but in the Bible, God shares everything that we need to prosper spiritually. So every time you crack open your old Bible, or open the app on your phone, or do whatever you do to access that life-giving Word, remember this. There's nothing that can compare to what you are about to take in. There's no equal to his word. In it, he gives blessings that we can't find anywhere else. When you make God's word your foundation, when you let your roots go deep into what he tells us, you're planted right where God wants you to be. Thank him for showing us who he is and what he's done to save us by his grace alone, through faith in Jesus alone. Shown to us in his word alone. Amen. And now this peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.